from as far as I, as I can understand, and I've only been looking at this for 43 years, that Jesus is a metaphor. Jesus is a metaphor, a symbolic metaphor. It's symbolizing something when you talk about Jesus. One of the names in the ancient Greek for Horus was Iosis. In Greek, Horus was Iosis. I-E-S-U-S. You can interchange I's and J's. So you can interchange Iosis with Jesus or J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. Jesus, according to the reference works for thousands of years, is the Son. This is why we worship Christ or Jesus on Sunday. The Prince of Darkness, as I said, his name was Set. So God's Son walked across the sky in 12 steps, and he left the world. And when he left the world, he left the world in the hands of the Prince of Darkness. But he said he would come again. And he does every morning about 540, 5.45, 5.30. And we're told that when he left, that those who saw when he left were told that just as you have seen him leave on a cloud, he will come back on a cloud. And that's true. Check it out every night and see if there isn't a cloud out there when the sun leaves. And most likely there will be a cloud in the sky when he comes back. So when you understand that the stories in the Bible, in the New Testament, the entire New Testament is a metaphor. The entire New Testament is trying desperately to tell you something. It is a metaphor. A metaphor. Let me give you an example of a metaphor. A metaphor is like Aesop's Fables. Aesop's Fables is a children's book that you read these little stories to the children and they teach a child certain principles and concepts and ideas that you couldn't ordinarily teach them. But teach them as an example and a little story, and then they get it. Because after all, there's only two kinds of people in the world, those who get it and those who don't. And most people don't get it. And, and so we have a story, an Aesop's fable, of a race between the tortoise and the hare, if you will probably remember that as a kid where the tortoise is going to race the uh, rabbit. And the rabbit is obviously so fast that he takes off and he gets right up to the finish line within a few moments and is so proud of how fast he is, he just sits down to take a nap and wait till this other turkey catches up. Right? And the tortoise is just plugging along and so he plugs along until he gets caught up with the rabbit and then he crosses the goal line quietly and then the rabbit wakes up to discover that he's lost the race. Why? Because you were arrogant. You were smart aleck and arrogant and thought you had it all made. And the tortoise won the race. So this is a story you tell the child, which teaches a child that just because you're good looking, handsome, wealthy, intelligent, come from a good family, that doesn't mean you're going to win the race. Usually the poor working class guy who has a family, who has, raises his children, saves his money, buys a home, eventually one day he has a beautiful family, a lovely home, and a nice life. And the Elvis Presleys and the big movie stars are dead on drugs or shot themselves or something. So just because you are fast and clever and good, that doesn't mean you're going to win the race. So that teaches a child a concept. Well, this is what the New Testament trying to teach you something, but <clears throat> the people who are presenting this New Testament to us are now arguing about what kind of a tortoise was it? Was it a desert tortoise or, a, or an ocean-going tortoise? Or what kind of a rabbit was it? And where did this take place? And uh, where exactly was the goal line? And how fast was the rabbit actually able to run? And so they are sitting down with all of this uh, discussion back and forth and have missed the point. The point is the story, the Bible is the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. Come on, my God, wake up. It's just a story. But the story is so profound in its implications 
when you understand it's a metaphor. It's trying to tell you something. And it has the teacher saying, it has Jesus saying, many will look with their eyes but not see, and listen with their ears but not hear, and with their heart not get the sense of it. We're not talking about an actual man who lived. We're not talking about an actual <clears throat> God who lived. We're not talking about, and there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no King Solomon or King David. They never existed. I used to talk with a rabbi who was the president of the American Rabbinical Association back in the mid-60s. He lived in Newton, Massachusetts, and he was the president of all American rabbis. And he and I used to sit for hours and talk. And I asked him once, Rabbi, tell me the truth. You're not talking to a fool now, you're talking to me. Tell me the truth. Was there a King Solomon and a King David? Was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And he says, look it, the Catholics have a religion. The Buddhists have got their, their thing. The Hindus have got their religion. The Jews have got their thing, you know. It's just a religion. It's just a, it's just a story. And so he explained to me, and I said, and the, it was interesting, I said, well then, are you saying that these, these stories are fictitious? He said, of course they're fictitious. It's a story. And then he explained to me that the, in the Hindu religion, we have Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the triune god, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. In Egypt, we have Osiris, Isis, Horus. In Christianity, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So in Judaism, we have to have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the triune God. Incidentally, Abraham was not called Abraham in the Bible. He was called Abram. Did you know that? Because most people don't. Abram was from the land of Chaldea. Did you know that? Abram was from the land of Chaldea. Do you know where Chaldea was? Chaldea is what we call today Iraq. So the great and holiest of all holy men to the Jew world Jewish religion is Abraham, who really wasn't Abraham at all. It was actually Abram, and he was an Iraqi. That's the history. And then when you find out Abram, A-B-R-A-M, as the rabbi and his rabbi, I was going to give his name, as the rabbi said to me, Abraham's first name was actually Abram, A-B-R-A-M, because in the ancient Hebrew, A-B, Ab, is father. And Ram, R-A-M, is Aries, the Ram. The constellation of the Ram is Aries, the Ram. This is why when Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and he sees the children of Israel uh, worshiping the golden calf and he throws the law down and breaks the tablets. He was the first law. He broke the law. And consequently, he saw the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. Why? Go back and look at this story and you begin to see that the golden calf was actually the sun in the age of Taurus, Taurus the bull. Taurus the bull was the golden calf. This is why in England they even have a university called Oxford. It goes back to the worship of the golden calf, Oxford. We'll go on with all of that later, but again, Jesus represents a metaphor. The word Jesus is a metaphor, a symbolic term for spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Let me go back over that again for you. This is a very important point. Jesus, not a man, but Jesus is a metaphor for a, for a, it's a symbolic metaphor for spiritual and intellectual enlightenment as opposed to ignorance. So consequently, everything that the Bible has Jesus saying and doing is what 
intellectual, spiritual enlightenment would do in sight in any given cir circumstances. Consequently, we're told that Jesus was arrested and um, they brought him into the temple and at nighttime and tried him and found him guilty of sedition. And um, you go back and look at that story. First of all, if you're sound asleep and you've been very, very tired and you're right in the middle of a very sound sleep and someone slips into your bedroom and turns on a 600 watt bulb right next to your bed, it not only frightens you, but immediately you turn your head away. You don't want to, because it hurts your eyes. Why? Because the light is too brilliant. It's too bright and it hurts your eyes. Symbolically, that's what we're talking about in the Bible. When somebody who was spiritually enlightened, brilliant, so to speak, someone who is spiritually alive with intellectual and spiritual enlightenment, and he's trying to enlighten you. And you're listening to that one as he speaks. What you're doing is you are judging the spiritual and intellectual enlightenment to see what you decide about it, whether you think it's true or not. So what you're doing is you are, you are judging spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Where? Up here in the temple that's the part of your brain in the temple you are trying the light of God's word intellectual spiritual enlightenment in the temple consequently when you decide after hearing someone who is trying to enlighten you spiritually you've decided that this guy is full of bull and you don't want to hear him anymore you heard enough of this what you have just done is you now have put to death you have condemned him to death to die. You have condemned spiritual and intellectual enlightenment to die. Where? Well, where did Jesus, where was it said that Jesus died? In Golgotha, skull place, the place of the skull. You put intellectual, spiritual enlightenment on trial in the temple. And when you decide you don't want to hear any more spiritual enlightenment or intelligence, then you decide to condemn that spiritual enlightenment to death where? In Golgotha, skull place, in your head. So the whole story of the New Testament is the war between spiritual and intellectual intelligence as opposed to a world of darkness, ignorance, ill-informed ignorance. And of course, spiritual and intellectual enlightenment always dies between two thieves. The regret for the past and fear of the future. That's always killed everything. Consequently, what 